We are in a really big race against time at the moment. Our native species are at crisis point. So far we've monitored two full seasons, 24 chicks, and not one of those chicks has survived. This is a bird, Logan. He's here in pieces. No birds to um, fly the seeds around. No future forests. For many, predator free is no longer about the outcome. It's about me belonging to a community to achieve an outcome. Took on a rat line, took on another one a few months later, and just away, I love it. That little contribution becomes part of a much bigger success story. Here we are, about to create the world's first predator free capital city. What we now have left in the Perth is something less than 50 rats and 50 possums. Eradication is a whole different ballgame. Getting those few predators that are left is going to be the real challenge. In 1986, we decided to do something really significant. A bunch of wildlife staff and park rangers from Tiana said, we're going to have a crack at this. And Breaksy Island was born, our first predator-free island. Then we had Rakarua Māori and said, based on what you've learned here, we're going to do Rarotupa, Whenua Ho, Putahinu, Toki Hepa. Everybody said it was impossible. New Zealand, I don't know what it is, it's that combination of the number eight wire mentality and the can-do attitude and just saying, no, let's give it a crack. And now look where we are, we keep scaling up, we keep building. Within 14 years, New Zealand was doing the biggest islands in the world. And that's really created the platform that supercharged Predator Free. Pretty lucky to be living here. It's a fantastic spot and every day you wake up and look at it and go like, wow, this is amazing. One of the things that really strikes you is on an offshore island with no predators, the birds all come down onto the ground because there's nothing for them to be scared of. If more people saw places like this, they would realise how special it is. It's hard to put into words, but you do feel very contented here. Often I just come out and I just sit and I just listen, and it's amazing to be somewhere that all you hear are the sounds of nature. You know, you hear the winds, you hear the sea, and you hear the bird song, and that is just so good for you, I think. Predator Free 2050 is the chance to go, this is what we want. We want a New Zealand that was more like it used to be, that's more like our offshore islands. And we have this unique opportunity to do it now because if we don't do it now, we're gonna lose the things that are hanging on by a thread.
you get rid of the predators, and basically the birds look after themselves. We don't have to do a lot of management here because they've got a healthy ecosystem. So if your ecosystem's in balance, then everything else is in balance. The main thing is just to make sure there's no um, predators turning up. For some of them, it could be a boat close to shore, um, anchoring, and if it's a rat on board, it might smell land, jump ship and swim ashore. It's like a little bit of ground water, and maybe just a little bit of small native insect, but um, yeah, no rat or anything uh, bad on there. Okay, and it's ready to go again. Did you hear that? That zeet zeet, that really, that's a little robin calling. But if you hear that zeet, it's a really, there. That's a hee hee. They were extinct everywhere else on the mainland. This is the last place in New Zealand where hee hee existed. And if it wasn't for Hituru, we wouldn't have hee hee. They'd be gone like the huia. You know, you're looking at 3,000 hectares, so you've got multiple habitats for a whole range of different species. So it really is like an ark. And birds like the hehe can survive. Kōkako were also released here. The Kōkako released here in the 1980s as well, um, brought from elsewhere in New Zealand where they were doing logging. They needed somewhere safe to put them. Kaka are great. I love it at the moment. There's huge flocks of kaka around at the moment. I saw 50 the other day, take to the ear. I think to aim for predator-free New Zealand is a fantastic aim. If we can focus on taking out predators, then, you know, these guys know how to breed, they know how to raise their young. You know, as long as there's a good food supply for them, basically we'll end up with something like this. Years and years ago, people thought it wasn't realistic for us to wipe pests off islands. That's now commonplace for us. It's done all across the world, and New Zealand's been a world leader in island eradications. New Zealand is basically one big island. The only difference is we have a lot more people living on this island. That's why it's important to bring everybody along with us on the journey and making sure we've got the community and the people behind us for this initiative. So these are sort of our go-to method of rat detection at this stage. These and the wax tags. Uh, so basically all they are is a piece of core flute card, just corrugated plastic. And we just try and get as much of this nice oozy peanut butter into the little corrugations as we can. Give them every opportunity to come and eat our food. We put two cards and wax tags out across the peninsula to try and detect those last surviving rats. They come down to eat all the peanut butter, it's their favourite bait, and then they leave these distinctive chew marks on the card so you can detect teeth and the pattern of what, the, what their teeth marks look like and how much of the cards they eat. And so we know that this site is still being visited by a rat and that we need to then go and visit that site and target that animal specifically. We're right into survivor detection now. We're currently chasing down individual rats, so right at the tail end, and, and that is quite a tricky business, you know, particularly in this environment. It's never been done before. The teams have really stayed focused, and their jobs have changed, you know, so they've gone from maintaining this base network of traps and bait stations, and now we've kind of turned them into super hunters on these search and destroy missions. So, you know, that's, that's required real focus in an area to, to think like, how are we going to get this one individual or these couple of individuals in this very confined area? This particular rat has been hanging around for a couple of weeks here. I think the rat's actually moving around because we had detections outside the grid on the south side, and now we have detections outside the grid on the north side. Almost two weeks ago now, we established a grid within this, and so far, it hasn't worked. We must step back and show some real respect for these animals, because 
There's a reason why rats have managed to follow us to every corner of the world. You know, they're incredibly adaptable. They can live almost anywhere and they're scavengers. You know, they can eke out a living on all sorts of different things. So for us to think there's one uniform approach, that's entirely wrong. And what we're seeing now is, is we get to these last individual animals on Miramar, we're having to figure out what is this rat's particular preference to get it to engage with a trap or a bait station. We want this to be nice and firm for a rat so that they don't feel it move and make a little entrance so that it's easy access. And with any luck, we'll have a dead rat. One of the tools that we're relying on are these things called remote sensors. They send out a blue pulse, which tells us when the trap is open and everything's as it should be. Well, that'll change to yellow when it's been activated, and that'll automatically send an email or a text message out, letting us know that, hey, the trap's been activated at this point in time, and then we can go and clear it out. And it looks like we've got a rat. So we'll just bag him up. Hey, Biz. Hey. We've got a rat. Radis ratus, basically, a female uh, who's, who's lactating, basically feeding young. So, yeah, very healthy specimen. And this is incredibly complex. We're, we're, we're right in the unknown here. This has never been done in this sort of environment. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm confident we will get there. So we're in the Perth block now, the area that we're looking after, and it's bounded here by the Barley River, which goes up in this direction, and the Perth just over there. So all of the country behind me is part of the area that we're looking to make predator free. And right now, we have no possums in. I think we're almost down to the last three stoats, and we're down to the last 20 rats. Getting rid of the last remaining survivors is always the biggest challenge. We know that the cost of getting rid of reducing populations may be here. The cost of getting rid of the last rat or stoat is way up here. The next big challenge is producing an artificially intelligent camera that can sit in the landscape for a year that tells us if a rat, stoat or possum has arrived in that landscape. So this is our AI camera. Um, a little bit different to normal. This camera is designed to look down and watch a footprint on the ground. It's quite a big footprint though. It's a super wide angle lens. What happens is the lure dispenser is putting out a little bit of mayonnaise and that draws the rats, stoats and possums into the field of view. And then the camera under here has got some PIR sensors, just like your garage door sensor. And they fire up and tell the camera it's time to wake up and record because something's about to come under the field of view. Now these are thermal cameras, so you can only see warm things. But what's happening is that the computer software is looking at that image and it's giving me a little percentage of how sure it is based on everything you've taught me. So right now in the, in the hills, we're gathering more and more of that footage so that we can train the AI to be very reliable when it tells us what it thinks it's seeing. That thermal camera is the new tech that's been used in driverless cars. So other parallel industries means we're able to transfer that tech to conservation. We can never develop this technology alone for conservation, but because it's been used somewhere else, we can begin to apply it here. New technology is going to be absolutely crucial to help us attain this goal. One of the most important impacts of new technology is about making things cost efficient over long time frames. We don't know how we'll be controlling predators in, say, 20 years' time, but I'm sure we're going to get better and better at it. If we are going to deliver on this mission, we need to be trying new things. And so one of the roles that we play is to fund really excellent science, which is at the cutting edge of thinking about how we can make this difference at the scale we need to make it. The involvement of philanthropic organisations with the Crown to crack some of these really gnarly problems has enabled a really tight focus to change the game. And then once we have the new method, we can begin to deploy it across the country. 
We've got massive investment going into place, up to $50 million going into science investment in this space. What brings us together is developing awesome tech that benefits the environment. So that's really saving uh, species from going extinct. And the fact that all these guys are amazing engineers just gives us the abilities to actually do something about it. This certainly is a very, very different type of drone or, or UAV. 200 kilo payload runs on unleaded petrol, two hour flight time, and we're looking at up to about 100 kilometer uh, range for communications as well. We are genuinely innovating in this country around how we might make a difference. And I think that's why I love a big moonshot mission. There's nothing like something that we think is gonna be really hard to achieve to catalyze people to get excited and think outside of their usual frames of reference. So this is like an automated version of a tracking tunnel. When it walks over the surface, it collects information on its paws, and from that it's able to think for itself and make a decision about what that species is. The aim is that this is out for a year without servicing and is operational for the full 12 months. We want what we call set and forget systems, being able to have tools that are left out that do the work for us, and that's going to be one of the biggest game-changing parts of the scenario. AI is a major in terms of enabling predator-free 2050, and the cost per hectare for the detection moves from about $60 a hectare with Chad and the team checking all the cameras, down to about something under $10 a hectare, so there's about a six-fold reduction in the cost so that we can scale predator-free New Zealand. We've got until 2050, and a lot of the tools that we're probably going to be using in 20 years, I don't think we can even imagine what they, they're going to be until we start progressing further and further down this pipeline. We think, and we're getting more confident, that we may be able to remove rats from forested landscapes. But if for any reason we can't, or if we need an insurance policy, the only insurance policy that's out there right at the moment is genetic engineering. Gene drives are a, a particular technology that has been hypothesized as being an effective way to get rid of pests. The point of a gene drive is that you can introduce a genetic element into that organism's DNA, and then that genetic element will go through the population of that organism. And in doing so, damage the reproduction or the fertility or the ability to survive of that organism. For Māori, uh, the mixing and mingling of genes is, is tapu, and it's going to be a difficult conversation. Gene editing can say, let's get rid of toxins. Instead, what we're going to do is alter the whakapapa of something. And again, there's a philosophical question about whether we as humans have the right to alter the DNA of another species. However, if we look at it as a, as a tool to um, enact kaitiakita, to save our biodiversity and what we've got left of it, then I think there is a discussion to have. But I don't think that any one entity can make that decision alone. Gene editing is controversial, and it will need a lot of work with the New Zealand people to understand whether they want that technique. But I suppose if I was to put one plug in for it, I think it should be explored right now so that we know about the risks and we know about its capability and then we can make an informed decision about whether it's appropriate. The objective with this possum project is to eradicate possums from the Kaitaki range and also the farmland down to the coast. Week after week we're removing more and more and starting to see uh, less and less on our cameras. Now we're getting down to the, to the last individuals in the farmland area, so um, that's showing us that their home ranges are expanding um, and that's hopefully going to make them easier to detect and also remove from this point on. So possums are relatively easy. The first thing is they breed very slowly, once or twice a year. So if you get an invading possum, you've got plenty of time 
to not only detect it, but then remove it. The dogs are like the main reason that we're able to get possums, because even if you do come in here and you have thermal imaging, and you get onto a possum like in its nest site or something like that, it's just gonna duck away from you. And if you look at all this, like how much bush you would have to search through, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Good girl, Jepto. Where's the possum? Where's the possum? And you see Gus going up that tree like that. Where is it, Jepto? Where is it? Yeah, I can see him up there. So he's on this side of the tree, and we can just see uh, he might be looking away from us. And, but then we use this thermal imaging, and we can pick up that heat of him up in that tree. The next element that the scheme really needs to succeed is social licence. And that means, do the people of New Zealand support not only the goal, um, but also the kinds of things that we're going to need to do to be able to achieve that goal? When you first explain to a, someone new to New Zealand or new to ecology that in order to preserve these things that we love, we actually have to kill these other things. That's a hard thing for people to grasp. Killing isn't nice, but um, it is kind of part of life as we see it, if, yeah. And he's fairly fresh. Oh, he's goody. I find it really difficult that conservation in New Zealand is often focused on killing things, but I work here on Olver and I work on the mainland and I see the difference that having no pests makes. It is a necessary evil. At the moment with Predator Free New Zealand we know that there are a huge number of people in the country that support it and are very active in supporting it. So I think it's quite clear that we do have this social license and it's not just a, a permission as in tick a box. So I think we see a country of people that are really motivated and they see that their identity is tied to these birds and to let harm happen to those birds is really a reflection of our own character. And so in that regards, I see Predator Free New Zealand as a, a cause for environmental justice, really. We have a sign-up form for how people can get in touch and get a trap and one of our questions is, how did you hear about us? And Many times uh, people have said, oh, um, I heard you mentioned at a dinner party. And, you know, when rat trapping has reached dinner party conversation, you know that something's working. It's great to see all the tuis back and the kingfishers and grey warblers. Love them. I think it's one of the most exciting things we've ever embarked on in this country. I was in a room eight or nine years ago when we first talked about the idea and the concept. The thing that we've seen since then, which has been by far the most humbling, has been the huge community uptake. It is not going to be possible unless we have people on board with us and unless we have the social license to do the work. We can develop as many new technologies as possible, but the most important thing is having the community come with us on the journey. You got rid of those um, rats in your bedroom. Okay, so guys, get into your two groups. Hush, thanks. All right, group A, don't forget with your equipment, put your gloves on this group. Boys, you're gonna go this side of the river. Gloves, good practice. We've been working with the Auckland Council to get a number of acres that we can use in the school to work on the well-being of our students through having them come into this space to have access to environmental learning. It's about 10 hectares that's been not used and so it's just quite a mess in there. Easy as. I'm doing it with <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've got a nice little possum there. Appreciate it. 
We've started with the trapping because so much of reforestation is about trapping and getting rid of the predators. We've got about three rat motels that are just like boxes that have got just plain rat traps in them. We've got about two, three possum traps and then we've got about two Dock 200s which are our big one for doing for that catch our stoats and ferrets. Nothing. Next one's just up ahead. What we're trying to do is have our students engage in removing all of the pests, whether they're plant or animal scented, have those removed from the forest, but while they're doing that, to understand all the different trees, insects, birds and animals that exist in these places, and through that we'll get incidental health and well-being because they're engaging in these places, they're moving around in these places, and most of all, they're learning, they're picking up knowledge about the environment. Health has everything to do with the environment that causes it. And if we don't understand our environments, our water, our mountains, our, our ngahiri, our bush, we have no chance of pursuing health. All you have to do is touch your keyboard and go online and you'll see how um, bad the Kiwis have got. But we're getting them back up there because we're all getting out and we're all trapping. But yeah, it hasn't been too good for the native birds. They've been knocked around the last 100 years. These native birds, like, like the Kiwis, our national like, logo, I mean, it, it's what makes our country unique. To see them go would be a real shame, and so we just want to bring back that, like, that uniqueness that we have here in New Zealand. If we lose biodiversity, we lose language and traditional environmental knowledge that's connected to that plant or that animal. We have no chance of uh, pursuing well-being and health as Māori or as New Zealanders if those are gone. We've got to do more to try and stop that decline as quickly and effectively as we can. Yep. Yep. Still good? Yep. Have you ever seen a Kiwi's win? Do you want to see? Yeah, you see how crazy it is. That's it. Amazing. That's why they're flightless. <laughs> I've, I've held a few Kiwi in now, and the novelty never ever wears off. Yeah, they're very cool birds. Unlike any other birds that we have, you know, so so unique and very cool. We use this as an opportunity just to make sure that the transmitter's still attached really nicely. But he's looking good, so we'll just give him a quick way uh, and then we'll get him back to bed so he can get some more sleep before nightfall. We try not to leave any, any feathers or anything. We try and pick all the feathers up. You know, it just helps with predators and that sort of thing. Any smells? Young. So what we're wanting to do now is basically just check the viability of the egg, make sure that they're fertile and also that the embryo inside is, or the chick, is alive and basically prepare them for transporting them out of here. For Kiwi populations in conservation estate, the real threat is stoats in most places and the real crux of it is that kiwi chicks are very vulnerable to stoke predation. The adults are big enough and tough enough and ugly enough to look after themselves, but the chicks are really vulnerable to even quite low levels of stoats. 
We know that by taking the eggs from the incubating birds and hatching them in a captive facility, that the chick's survival rate increases significantly. So if we were to leave the eggs with the parents, the chick's survival rate to breeding age is probably only about 5%. Kiwi lived for a long time, 40 or 50 years. So there's a good chance that what we're seeing is a mostly aging population of adults that's not being replaced quite as fast as they're dying. And as long as that continues, they will slowly decline. So they're not on the brink of extinction, but they'll get there one day if we don't do something. So the ZIP team focuses a lot on whether we've got the rats, stoats and possums out of the system. But what does it all mean for the wildlife? What we're seeing in the Perth is the early signs of Theo, Kakariki and Rock Wren beginning to rebound because these predators for the last year and a half have been exceedingly low or are already at zero. And our best estimate is that we've got around 160 kia now in that valley. So the place is beginning to become alive and thriving again. What actually defines New Zealand is this amazing biodiversity that is found nowhere else in the world. And it's biodiversity that doesn't need to be just on an offshore island. It could be in our backyards. Get a lot of tui you know, coming into the garden now. Had a ruru that's been gracing our backyard for the last few months. And then, um, yeah, lucky enough to get a kararia uh, come and land with its kill. And didn't seem to mind me coming up close to it. Yeah, it was really cool seeing that just in your backyard. It was, yeah, amazing. A woman a couple of weeks ago emailed really excitedly. She, she's lived on the peninsula for 51 years. And she said, what is this? I've never seen one of these before. Is this an Australian lizard? And I said, no, that's a Rokawa gecko. Rokawa is the Māori name for Cook Strait. Uh, this is its home. For her, that's absolute proof that the trapping she's been doing is working. It's good when you hear people in Portobello and Broad Bay where I live saying that they've never seen so many birds before. A lot of people are now saying there's some good numbers of pigeons, good numbers of tui coming into people's yards, they're feeding them. So it's a win-win. It's a <laughs> I love the words our nature. It's not about doc, it's not about us, it's about you as a New Zealander. And it's this land of birds, this incredibly special place. <laughs> we wake up with a bird call, our money has got our beautiful birds on it. You know, it's who we are as a nation. exhausted. He looks like a healthy chick, so give it three to four weeks and he'll be joining his friends out on the island. If we don't nurture nature, we don't have a future. It is about nature's ability to nurture us. It's our health, it's our well-being, it's, it's who we are as a people. Having that focus on the environment, how we protect her, how we nurture her and how in turn she nurtures us needs to be always at the forefront of our mind to make sure that the decisions we make today are protecting the environment, the taonga that we have to pass on to future generations.
2050 for me is a New Zealand where the lands and the forests are thriving and burgeoning with vitality and people are well within that. And then these models of restoring our environment have changed our economic systems, have changed our political systems such that we are reorientating around protecting te taiao. Trip set, rabbit meat. This could be a globally significant um, program of work, uh, which I think is cool for the planet. The two birds that are going to be released today signify a step change in the restoration of Kiwi on Taranaki Maunga. We are all about partnerships. We are all about making sure that our broader community groups and whānau have an opportunity to participate in such a huge piece of work. What we're seeing too is an, is an increase in these wonderful days throughout Aotearoa, whereby we are restoring our biodiversity and taking kiwi from A to B and starting to manage these things. We should not forget the many years it's taken us to get to here today. We had a lot of hard work from a lot of people. Kia ora mai tato. Papa tapu kei raro, tanaki manga tapu kei wainga. E rongo whakiri ake ki runga, tutu whakamaua kia tina. Huia rangi, huia papa, huia... Tanaki. Our koro, our mountain, he has shown himself. So it is, it's a really special day for everybody. We uh, tried to get our kids, our kids up there and to have a really good look, because I think those are the kinds of images that our children will never, ever forget. And it kind of becomes a little bit of a bridge for them to, to perhaps start to enter into this kind of important mahi. Off to the next one. I would say I think about the environment a lot because it's our home, it's all we have, and if we don't preserve it, then we're going to have a huge problem. No matter what else is happening in the world, this is what we have. We've got to look after it. I love hearing our native birds. Every time I'm going to the bush, whether I'm mountain biking, walking or anything, it's just such a nice sound. It just, I don't know, it's just something that just brings joy. We see concepts of kaitiakitanga being used often by Māori and non-Māori, meaning uh, places like this need us to be guardians of them. But in the end, it'll be the forest that looks after us. We need the forest, this water, the ocean, to give us health, or we won't make it. And at the moment, we're so human-centred that we're missing the big picture that if water's unhealthy, we're unhealthy. If mountains aren't surviving, neither will we. I don't think we're winning the battle just yet, but I think we're on the right track. Yeah. Need to keep fighting for a, a, the day where we can see those big numbers, big groups again, and Kia more widespread across the South Island like they used to be. There's so much more we can do and we should be doing it fast. We either commit boots and all or we just sink into this morass of continued ecosystem degradation and a never-ending battle against the predators. Ecosystem health and uh, the restoring that natural capital of New Zealand is absolutely the bedrock of our sustainable and prosperous future. Predator-free 2050. I think it will have huge benefits long-term for our sense of identity and our sense of uh, what we are that is uniquely Aotearoa. I think too about those generations of people still to come that we have a duty to as well. We need to show them we have cared for nature, cared for the life support system for people on this planet. You're going to go back up to those mountains and be safe. 
Alrighty, you ready to go? Ready? Goodbye. Good girl. It's not just about bringing the species back, it's about looking after the home for the species and making sure that our manu, that our relations have everything that they need to be able to flourish so that we can flourish. It's a big vision and a, a long-term dream, but I think in incremental stages, we're likely to get there. Over time, I think we'll see a few spots of New Zealand um, that actually pull this off, uh, and we can spread out from there. So a couple of years ago, if you'd asked me if we could pull this off, I would have said, oh, I doubt it. I can't even see the way or the pathway. But I suppose over the last couple of years, the work of our team has shown that it looks like we can do it for possums. We are now well down the track of learning how to do for rats and we've had surprises around whether we can completely remove stoats out of the landscape. So I would say, hang on New Zealand, because we're not that far away from beginning to expand this technique and begin to roll it to a point where we can just move through and over that next piece of forested landscape. It's been a, a massive, massive year, huge operation and, and a lot of learning for us to take forward. Miramar's just the first phase for us before we move out across the city. So, you know, this is kind of the coming towards the end of the first battle, but, but the war's just begun. This whole kind of vision of a predator-free Aotearoa by 2050 has really captured people's attentions. But more than that, it's spurned people into action. So we're seeing huge community resilience, huge community connectivity by people stepping up to participate in the shared vision. We live in a capital city where our kids get to see kaka every day. That's becoming normal for Wellingtonians. We're changing the DNA of the city and what it means to be a Wellingtonian. And that's pretty awesome. A whole new generation of rangatahi, young Kiwi growing up, that now know that nature's not supposed to be over there. It's supposed to be right here with us because we are not separate to it. Having grown up uh, a lot of the time away from any kind of native experience of New Zealand wildlife, I think um, having something like the kaka just as, as a normal part of your life is really enriching. My second daughter, Thea, uh, when she was just over one, she spent a lot of time sitting uh, eating her food uh, and watching the kakas here, and uh, as a result, it landed up her second word uh, was kaka after her first word being daddy. Um, although for a long time after that, she was confused and she thought that all birds were called kaka. What is that? That's my coat. <laughs> Just do a wave. Oh, that really went on my head. What? is happening here in Wellington now is that these birds are now part of our everyday lives and I and I guess um, what's you know important about that is that they are us you know that they are the animals that give us our identity when you hear a tui with its two voice boxes singing in your backyard you get why um, our tui music awards are called the tuis you know when you pick up a log in your backyard and you've got a big ugly wetter steering up here, you get why our film effects company is called Wetter Effects and um, yeah, I mean fundamentally we're Kiwis, you know. So I think it's, it's about looking after who we are.